live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. January 4th, 2005. We're down in Miami, Florida for the Orange Bowl in the BCS National Championship game between the undefeated Oklahoma Sooners out of the Big 12 and the undefeated USC Trojans out of the Pac-10. The game isn't at all important to our story today. USC curb stomped Nebraska 55-19 and established themselves as one of the greatest and most dominant teams in the history of college football by winning the national championship before it got vacated. Rather, for the purposes of our story, we're talking about the halftime show. Because if there's any Orange Bowl halftime show that comes into your mind when you think of the Orange Bowl halftime show, odds are it's this one featuring Ashley Simpson. Well, the good news is that she wasn't lip-syncing this time. Take that, SNL. The bad news was, well, this sounded horrible. I've legitimately seen karaoke performances where the person went up there, a random friend of theirs picked out the song for them, and they had no idea what the song was, and they somehow sounded better than this mess. The entire crowd booed in unison. Do you realize how hard that is to do to get an entire crowd to boo you all at once? Never before has the United States of America been as united on something as this January night in 2005, when they all agreed that Ashley Simpson's performance was absolutely terrible. And don't get me wrong, it was awful. It made my ears bleed. It made me lose the will to live. It made me question my faith in Hollywood and in humanity. But in no way whatsoever is this the worst halftime show in Orange Bowl history. That's right. We're not talking about the infamous Ashley Simpson halftime show. That would be too obvious, and everyone knows about that one. Because 20 years before, there was a halftime show even worse and more disastrous. Because as bad as Ashley Simpson was, no one got hurt during it. Imagine a halftime show so bad that by the end of it, 21 spectators are being treated for injuries. No one should be getting injured while watching a halftime show in the stands. And that should go without saying. But in 1985, that's exactly what happened. And this is the story behind the worst, most disastrous, and by far, the most dangerous halftime show in the near 90-year history of the Orange Bowl. Before I talk about the show and what exactly happened during it, because trust me, it truly is remarkable, we need some context to understand the game. And with regards to the halftime show, how it was even created in the first place. It's January 1st, 1985, and we are going down to Miami for the Orange Bowl between the Washington Huskies out of the Pac-10 and the Oklahoma Sooners out of the Big 8. Yes, this game also happened to feature Oklahoma. And not only was this the last bowl game played, but this was the biggest bowl of the entire season. Call it the Vanessa Williams Bowl, because college football truly went ahead and saved the best for last, which wasn't always the case back then. In one corner, you had Washington, who entered this game at 10-1 and spent a good portion of the season as the number one ranked team in the country. In the other corner, you had Oklahoma, the number two team in the country, who entered this game at 9-1-1. We had no idea who the national champion would be, since BYU was ranked number one and already played in the Holiday Bowl. So we had no idea if we were looking at this game meaning just a bowl win or a shot at a co-championship. But regardless... This was a huge game. But what happened on the field in terms of the gameplay on this day isn't entirely relevant. Washington pulled off the upset to win 28-17. It's what happened at halftime with the score tied at 14 apiece in this back and forth affair. That's the real focus here. Not so much anymore, but for years, the biggest halftime show in all of college football was the Orange Bowl halftime show. Outside of the Super Bowl halftime show, this was the biggest halftime show in all of American sports. Most halftime shows for bowl games consisted of either nothing or just the marching bands from each school playing. For the Orange Bowl, after the bands played, 
It was a giant extravaganza that was nationally televised. What you're watching right now is the most recent one of these halftime shows from 1984. It's all sorts of bizarre and cheesy, which was par for the course for every halftime show. Do a lot of these choices make sense? Absolutely not. This one was a celebration of 50 years of the Orange Bowl. So why we have an entire section with laughably bad video effects devoted to Peter Pan, I have no clue. And why we have four costume Disney characters, and they're Mickey, Goofy, Donald, and Pinocchio, again, I have no clue. Seriously, if you can only have four Disney characters, why would you pick someone outside of the gang? Why not Minnie Mouse, or Pluto, or Daisy? How does Pinocchio make any sense? What the heck were they th Okay, wow, I'm getting off track. Anyways, here's the one from 1978, where they just brought the Main Street Electrical Parade from Walt Disney World to the Orange Bowl. And in 1983, they even got Lewis Clark, who had a top 10 hit with Hooked on Classics, to curate an entire original score for the Orange Bowl halftime, which was actually really cool, and was better than every single halftime show the Super Bowl had at that point. So you have an idea now of the Orange Bowl halftime show and how it worked. It was a pretty big deal in the realm of halftime. And the theme for this halftime show in 1985? It was the 35th anniversary of the Peanuts comic strip. Seems like an odd theme for a halftime show. Then again, the NFL decided five years later to do their Super Bowl halftime show surrounding the 40th anniversary of the strip, because we definitely needed to see two Charlie Brown themed halftime shows. Anyways, the show itself, confusing theme selection and all, was what you'd expect from these 80s cheesy shows, and I'll leave a link in the description if you want to watch the show for yourself. In fact, and I have to be honest here, it was better than a bunch of the Super Bowl halftime shows around this time frame. Were there elements that were awful? Oh, you bet. If you got all the dancers in sync for a particular section, it was a miracle. The plot line didn't seem to make a whole lot of sense, as the whole plot of the show was about Charlie Brown and the gang having access to a time machine. And I don't know how we went from 1917 to a Beatles song with no transition whatsoever. Having said that, there were some admittedly cool things considering the era that it was in. The voice acting was good, there was a scene where they emulated the Red Baron, and they had two vehicles shoot fireworks at each other, which looked cool. And I loved the lighting and how it made it look like Pigpen's Cloud of Dust. I've watched every Super Bowl halftime show ever, and this show would fit right in, and might even be better than the bulk of the shows that took place around this time. So from that perspective, the show was perfectly fine. Not something I would watch again by any means, but fine by the standards of the 80s. And again, if you want to experience the 15-minute spectacle for yourself, I'll leave a link in the description. But before the halftime show, Brian Gumbel said this about what the audience would be in store for. If this comes off like it did in rehearsal, frankly, you're in for a real treat. It did not. It did not come off like it did in rehearsal. Not in the slightest bit. Because I'm fairly sure that the grand finale was not supposed to happen the way that it did. Because for the grand finale, the gang and the Orange Bowl Queen sing a song about love and friendship and all that good stuff. And while they were singing about that, this happened. Did you catch that? You probably have no idea what I'm talking about at first glance. I'm going to zoom in on the fireworks. Notice how all the fireworks are shooting up vertically into the sky. That is, all except for one. Watch again. That tiny green speck that was fired from a cannon somewhere on the 15-yard line? That was supposed to launch vertically, just like every other firework. Instead, it launched horizontally. A vertical firework launches up, harmlessly into the sky. A horizontal firework, however, does not do that. Instead, a horizontal firework launches straight into the crowd where there is a bunch of people. And I think you might be able to see where this is going. Because right next to Peanuts classics like It's the Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown and Be My Valentine Charlie Brown was the iconic special from New Year's Day 1985, You Don't Know Fireworks Safety Charlie Brown. Now before I talk about the aftermath from this from an injuries and a what went wrong perspective, the absolutely insane part it's that not even a year before this, at Super Bowl 18, a very similar thing happened, where a firework during the grand finale of the halftime show 
launched into the stands and injured people. If you want to learn more about that, click the card in the upper right corner. But I bring that up not just because the last two big halftime shows had firework incidents, but because that Super Bowl was in Tampa. So considering how close Tampa and Miami are to each other, there is a very real chance that someone was at both of these games. Heck, maybe there was a fan who was sitting in close proximity to both of those accidents and is now traumatized for life by fireworks. And honestly, I wouldn't blame them if they were. As for the injuries, this wasn't just a minor thing. In total, 21 people got injured from this. There were 21 people who were watching a football game and wound up leaving with burns and had to be treated either on site or at the hospital. One of the cheerleaders was even hit in the back by debris. Injuries range from eye injuries to shin injuries to secondary burns across the body and the forehead. And there were many accounts of the event from witnesses. Stephen McKenzie, who sat nearby where the firework misfired, said, it shot across the field at a low angle and went into the crowd. I saw people jumping out of their seats, trying to get out of the way. It looked like it hit about a five to six foot radius and then spread out. James Wanderstock was a spectator sitting two rows below the site of the accident and said, it streaked right over. It was a flash. Dr. Robert Morgan, an Oklahoma fan attending the game, said there were sparks and smoke. I couldn't see. I was trying to get the specs out of my glasses. And another Oklahoma fan named Ernie Beaver said on the thing, a big fireball came right up in the stands. We couldn't do anything. It was coming so fast. So that raises the question, how the heck did this happen? First off, the Orange Bull had used fireworks many times before at their halftime show, all without incident. And that's because they usually did them from a company out of Tennessee. Seems kind of odd that Dan McNamara, the executive director of the Orange Bull committee, said that he couldn't remember the name of that Tennessee company, because that seems like something I wouldn't exactly forget. However, as they were planning to go with them, that company had to back out because their facility got damaged because of a fire. This meant that instead of going with their old reliable company, they had to scramble at the last minute to find a new company, Add Fire Inc., to do the fireworks. Never has there been a more fitting name in the history of anything than a fireworks company named Add Fire that literally added fire to the stadium. As McAmara said, this was a new company that we were dealing with. We thought they would deliver us a safer show and would be able to deliver more of an indoor type of fireworks show. This company does business with the same manufacturers the other company used, and we were extremely happy with the other company. And safe to say, this other company they were not happy with. That other company was in a heap of trouble. Because investigators figured out what went wrong with Ad Fire Inc. Turns out, the Miami Fire Department approved all the fireworks at 7 o'clock p.m just three hours before the show. Everything was inspected and good to go. Then, Ad Fire decided, for some reason, to add a fireworks cannon that was not present during the inspection. The cannon had a four inch diameter, and the force coming from that was impermissible even if it was fired correctly, so it wouldn't have passed the inspection. Supposedly, they added the cannon last minute to provide for greater mobility to getting everything on and off the field in time. But let's be honest, there are some things that you can do without a run-through and be perfectly fine. Shooting explosives that have not been inspected by the fire department is not one of them. As Christy Hickman, a spokesman for the fire department, said on the whole thing, the cannon was considerably greater than we would have allowed and considerably more powerful than all the other ones used. What the inspectors saw was an order. They thought that was it. And it was so much more powerful that instead of going 40 feet in the air, the fireworks shot a whopping 300 feet. A full 100 yards. The length of a football field. The cannon was literally seven and a half times more powerful than what was previously agreed upon. So yeah, that was not supposed to happen. And the fact that everyone impacted got released from the hospital that same day is a minor miracle. And for those curious, the following year, the halftime show for the 1986 Orange Bowl was done by Disney and dealt with the Living Seas, and there were no fireworks. So they weren't taking any chances for the foreseeable future. And between their incident at Super Bowl 18, done by Disney, 
and what happened to the Orange Bowl in 1985, I can't blame them. And somehow, Adfire Inc. is still around today. So this disaster didn't impact their operations at all. Even though you would think that they would be sued and shut down for this incredible display of negligence. Guess not. So anytime you watch a halftime show, and you think to yourself how bad the show is, just remember, it can always be worse. A bad singer won't send you to the hospital. A bad song selection won't damage your eyesight. Bad choreography won't damage your clothes and put your hair on fire. Because when Oklahoma fans said they wanted to experience an Orange Bowl that they would never forget, I'm fairly sure that this is not what they had in mind at all. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.